Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Better Than Ever Live, wherever you're watching or wherever you're listening. Hope you're making today your masterpiece. In today's show, we're going to talk about a new diabetes drug that helps people lose significant weight. We'll talk about supplemental vitamin D and how it might slow the aging process, how occasional binge drinking can cause various health problems, why exercise might lower your risk of cancer and help if you get cancer, how moderate exercise cuts the risk of stroke, and why walking is so important if you have knee arthritis. My name is Dr. David Geyer, double board certified orthopedic surgeon, sports medicine specialist, media medical expert. I help you feel your feel and perform your best regardless of age, injury, or medical history. I hope you're having a wonderful, wonderful Thursday afternoon out there. As always, please understand in this show, I'm not giving you medical advice. All the studies we're going to talk about, I'm just giving you information and education. It is not meant for medical advice. Georgia, I am glad to see you. Hope you are doing well in Greece. Uh, yeah, it's a uh, it's in here in the United States. We're heading into Fourth of July weekend, uh, one of our big summer holidays, big holidays in general. So, and following on a Monday, I imagine there'll be a lot of people out and about and traveling. So, I hope wherever you are you stay safe. If you have comments about any of the studies we talk about, if you have questions about any of the studies we talk about, and if you're interested, the one that I know is going to get a lot of discussion, if there is any, is going to be on this first topic because I have a lot of people ask me about it generally. But if you have any comments, questions, things like that, leave those in the chat if you're on YouTube, not in the comments. Facebook, LinkedIn, you can comment uh, as you normally do. I will answer those as we go. I would love it if you'd leave your first name and where you're located along with your comment and question. And if you have medical questions, orthopedic questions unrelated to what we talk about here, join me tomorrow at 12 p.m. Eastern time for Ask Dr. Geyer Live. Donald, it is good to see you. Uh, Very happy you're here. All right, let's get right to it because this is one that I know a lot of people have heard rumblings about. Uh, It's certainly being talked about a lot uh, in the integrative uh, medical world uh, that I am a part of. Uh, But there is a diabetes drug out there that can help non-diabetic people lose weight. This is not from some, you know, sketchy journal. This, you know, anecdotal evidence. This is a study published in the New England Journal of Medicine, probably the most reputable or thought to be one of the most reputable journals in all of medicine. So this is uh, a study of a recently approved FDA approved drug uh, for type 2 diabetics. It's it's meant to help people with type 2 diabetes reverse their diabetes and lose uh, some of their obesity, lose weight if they have obesity. Uh, it's called terzepatide. This is a similar drug to semaglutide that was approved last summer. They're both GLP-1 agonists. And what is exciting, yes, they're approved for type 2 diabetes, but where they're getting a lot of attention is they may very, very effectively help lose weight. Terzepatide, the newer one, is sold under the brand name Munjaro. And what the study uh, showed in uh, the New England Journal of Medicine, the researchers took more than 2,500 people uh, that did not have diabetes. Remember, it's approved for diabetes, but they wanted to test it in just everybody else, but not just random people. These were people that were obese, people with a BMI over 30, or they were overweight. They had a BMI over 27, but had at least one health-related or weight-related health condition, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, cardiovascular disease. So people with obesity or who were overweight and took the lowest dose, five milligram dose. And again, it's a weekly dose administered as an injection. And as uh, we'll talk about, they did it for 72 weeks. So about a, a year and a third, once a week, five milligram dose, the lowest dose, those people lost an average of 36 pounds. Those that took the 10 milligram dose lost 49 pounds. People on the highest dose, the 15 milligram dose, lost an average of 52 pounds. Almost 40% of the people in the study, and remember there were over 2,500 people in the study, almost 40% of them lost a quarter of their body weight. All in all, again, these are people without diabetes. They lost an average of 15 to 20% of their starting body weight over the course 
of the 72 weeks. And again, this is not just some anecdotal thing, double-blinded randomized clinical trial. Now, there were side effects. Again, this is an injection. It is not a pill that you give yourself. Uh, it's something you inject under, I can't really show you. You could do it in your upper arm. Typically, you do it in an area of fat, so like you pinch a little bit of your abdomen or maybe your gluteal uh, in your buttock region just under the skin. The most common side effects noted were nausea, diarrhea, constipation, somewhere between just over 2% and 7% of the people dropped out of the study due to side effects. Now, uh, terzepatide does have a black box warning about people with thyroid tumors, can't be used in people with thyroid tumors or people with certain thyroid conditions, so doctors are going to certainly ask about that. Here is what why I think it's interesting. This, uh, there's, a, there's a couple points that make this interesting. So, um, like I said, this is a fairly new, uh, newly approved drug. Semaglutide was last year. That's been out there as another GLP-1 agonist for type 2 diabetes that has shown very significant weight loss. Uh, it is, uh, in theory, uh, like I said, or it's not in theory, it is approved by the FDA. What I'm hearing from patients is that their insurance still will not pay for it. And I have heard numbers as high as $300 a dose when you go to the CVS, Walgreens type drug stores and pay for it out of pocket. One of the nurses in our practice said one of her patients or one of the patients of the practice said they were told it would be $20,000 a year because again, that at least that particular insurance that that person had was not being paid for. Now, what I think is interesting about this is semaglutide at least it's a peptide. It's like some of the peptides I've talked about on this show and in other videos on my YouTube channel and on my website. BPC-157, thymus and beta-4, CJC-1925, you know, AOD. There, there's all sorts of peptides. And this is a peptide like this. It is a GLP-1 agonist. But I say that because this has been around in sort of the functional medicine, integrative medicine clinics now for three or four years. And what I am hearing about, at least with semaglutide among people that have done it, is it works extremely well at helping people lose weight. Um, there is a small percentage of people, there are a small percentage of people, is a small percentage of people, that it bumps up their liver enzymes. So it's something you don't wanna just get on the internet and do yourself. You wanna have a doctor and follow your lab work on a regular basis. Um, it very, very effectively curbs your appetite. And what the reading and the literature, you know, I got a peptide certification earlier this year and GLP-1 agonists were talked about quite a bit as part of that. It does seem to do uh, something. This may not be its me whole mechanism of action in terms of weight loss, fat loss, things like that. But um, the it does seem to sort of create a, a gut brain disconnect. You know, when you're hungry, it tells your brain, hey, we're gonna create hunger pangs to start eating. It does seem to alleviate that. People that I've talked to that have been on semaglutide really, really rave about it just makes them not hungry uh, anymore. And you know, it uh, they finish a meal fairly quickly and don't feel like they need to eat more. They don't crave snacks later. Very, very effective as that, uh, you know, with that purpose. Um, I have heard a few people, really just one, talk about nausea with it, like the side effect of terzepatide in this study. Uh, I've heard mention of constipation with it, but all in all, the patients I've heard talk about it uh, and the people I've heard talk about it that, that use uh, semaglutide at least have been very, very pleased. But again, it is not something that you should go just get off, because you, you can buy peptides online, very, very questionable that they're any good if there's any peptide in it, plus they may have harmful fillers and chemicals, and you need to be managed by a doctor, have lab work taken, somebody that you know keeps an eye on your thyroid, keeps an eye on your liver, all of that kind of thing. And again, the only way you're probably gonna be able to get it from a CVS, Walgreens type of drugstore you know, with a prescription from a doctor is if you have type two diabetes. Now those people typically overweight, obese, very likely to get it uh, or be able to get it. But at least what I am hearing right now, and semaglutide's been out now for almost a year, uh, from the stories I'm hearing, people's insurance is not paying for it. That may change and there may be some insurance plans that do. That's again, just what I'm hearing. Uh, and that's why 
uh, people are looking for other options for it. I am just gonna say though, this is very exciting. Uh, obesity is as high as it ever has been in the United States and from what I'm hearing, lots and lots and lots of other countries are following right behind us as we send all our fast food chains and everything else uh, out there and people are doing more sedentary work. We're seeing obesity rise across the world but definitely here in the United States. Type 2 diabetes is skyrocketing with insulin resistance and, and all the problems that come with that. And those have so many downstream issues in terms of inflammation that causes, in my world, uh, arthritis and a number of bone and joint problems. It can lead, inflammation can lead to uh, Alzheimer's disease, cardiovascular disease we know about. Di diabetes is linked to, and insulin resistance linked to cancers and poor prognosis with cancers. So something that we can do, and what I, they didn't really study here because this was a study specifically on weight loss, but these GLP-1 agonists seem to be very effective at lowering blood sugars and correcting insulin resistance. So this could be a game changer. Uh, we'll see how it plays out with you know one of these things that even if it's approved, is it still considered experimental and not paid for? Very few patients, I would argue, can afford to pay $20,000 a year. It's really a shame uh, that if that's true, that, that that could be going on. Having said that, very, very exciting, but definitely, definitely, definitely do not get it from these online sites that sell peptides for research purposes only, uh, not to be used for human consumption uh, or human uh, use is what it'll say on the vial. Very, very dangerous to do that and likely wasting tons and tons of money. So for what that's worth, if you have questions about that, feel free to ask as the show goes on and I'll talk about it at the end. All right, another supplement, not a peptide, but another supplement that I've been taking for years and years and years now and I, I really recommend it to a lot of people. Not medical advice, again, I'm just giving you information and, edu and education, but Vitamin D has so many benefits. I just recorded a TV uh, segment for the two stations I do uh, daily uh, uh, health segments for here in Charleston. And one, uh, the one I did today was on vitamin D and lowering the risk of future dementia a decade later. But this is one, sort of along the same lines, a study that links vitamin D to slower aging. It was a study published in the journal Hero science, gyro science, gerontology, so gyro science. Uh, what these researchers did, they took data uh, from a cohort of people to try to see if there's a, uh, a relationship between vitamin D deficiency and advanced what we call epigenetic age, that true measure of your age, what your genes, how old they are, not just your chronological age. And there's five different, at least now, uh, epigenetic clocks that can give you probably a more accurate representation of how old you are. So you may be 50, but if your epigenetic age, your Horvath clock or something like that says you're 40, well, that's fantastic. What you don't want to be is your chronological age is 50, but it shows your real age, your epigenetic age to be older than that, 55, 60, things like that. But what they found, people who are vitamin D deficient have an epigenetic age on average more than a year younger than people, the people that have high level, or um, I said that backwards, the people that are vitamin D deficient, their epigenetic age is a year older than the people that are not vitamin D deficient. So what then they tried to figure out was, does giving a vitamin D supplement reverse those effects on epigenetic age? So they took over a thousand people, 68 years, uh, at, uh, on average at the start of the study, re-examined them at 75. But what they figured out, they figured out the ones that were vitamin D deficient at the beginning of the study, the ones that weren't. And then the ones that were vitamin D deficient and then supplemented vitamin D for seven years up to normal levels and compared their epigenetic age seven years later. Um, so basically you had people who were deficient but then supplemented up to normal levels and people who were deficient who didn't supplement and stayed deficient. And for two of the five epigenetic clocks, the people that went from vitamin D deficient to vitamin D sufficient through supplements 
were epigenetically younger by more than two and a half years, both the Horvath clock and the 7-CPG clock. Again, those are associated with chronological age. The other three clocks showed some effects, but they weren't statistically significant. Now, this doesn't get into why potentially vitamin D supplementation reversed the epigenetic clocks, but again, vitamin D has been linked to so many good benefits. I just mentioned the, the later dementia, lowering the risk of that, but it's immune function. It's thought to be involved in bone health. Not thought to be, it's been shown to be bone health, muscle health, all cardiovascular health, all kinds of reasons, uh, but it seems to have an effect on your epigenome and help you live longer. I, I, very few people, I, I've been surprised, uh, we get a lot of vitamin D studies even on my patients in orthopedics, because uh, we'll get whole lab panels. And it's amazing to me, even in a city like Charleston, and people who work outdoors are still significantly vitamin D deficient. And so it, it is something that is worth considering, having your vitamin D levels measured, potentially getting out in the sun more to get your vitamin D, potentially taking a supplement, all things potentially worth thinking about. All right. Let's talk not so good news, and that's alcohol. You've heard me rant about alcohol before, but we're gonna talk about it again today because you know, we talk about what's a safe level of alcohol, and the studies say, hey, less than one drink a day for women, less than two drinks a day for men. Those are averages. Those are not um, meant to say, hey, you're supposed to have a drink every day if you're a woman or two drinks a day if you're a man. And it is also not saying, oh, I should not drink six days a week and have seven drinks if you're a woman on a Saturday night or 14 drinks if you're a man on a Saturday night. And so people mistakenly think, oh, if my average alcohol is low, that's probably fine. But what we know is that there's a lot of what we call moderate drinkers, 30 and older, that their moderate drinking consists of binging on the weekend. And by binging, we're talking about having five or more drinks in a row within a short period of time. So say five drinks on a Saturday night. So again, you can drink one drink a day every day or seven drinks a day on a Saturday night. Which is worse? Well, the study was published uh, in the American Journal of Preventative Medicine out of Stanford. They took almost 1,300 drinkers, followed them for nine years, and they tracked how much they drank uh, alcohol and found that binge drinking led to a lot of different alcohol problems, and even more so than just among your moderate drinkers. They found that drinking an average of more than one drink a day for women, more than two drinks a day for men, or five or more drinks on the same occasion was linked to alcohol problems nine years later. People who binged, those people specifically, the binge drinkers, were five times more likely to have multiple alcohol problems, getting hurt, emotional problems, psychological problems for alcohol, having to use more alcohol to get the same effect, experiencing effects of alcohol at work, at school, or caring for children. So again, if you drink seven drinks on a Saturday night and don't drink the rest of the week, that's potentially worse in terms of your overall health than somebody that just has one drink a day, averaging one per week, or one drink per day over the course of the week. You're much better off spreading that out. Not to say that's a good thing, because we've talked about before that the studies that show that alcohol is good for your health are very, very misleading and probably not actually true. If anything, studies are showing now that alcohol at any level is harmful, especially for your brain. Those cardiovascular benefits that show that you live longer, have better cardiovascular mortality if you drink a glass of red wine every night, most of those studies have been shown to be flawed uh, because they took former alcoholics as the control group and so the, the studies were skewed. I think we're gonna find more and more studies over the next 12, 18 months that just continue to pile on showing that really no level of alcohol, even if it's red wine, you know, with its resveratrol. I, I heard, I was reading, or maybe I was listening to David Sinclair's podcast, you know, who wrote Lifespan, and he was talking about resveratrol is in red wine and it's very helpful as a supplement, but the problem is the amount of resveratrol you would need to actually create a therapeutic dose to do on a daily basis. I, I forget the number because I, I remember laughing. It was something like 200 glasses of wine per night to get enough resveratrol to do what you needed to do. You're better off just taking a resveratrol supplement. Do not drink that level of wine. But again, none of this is medical advice, just something 
for you to think about. All right, exercise and cancer risk. This did not come from a specific study. This actually came from the Washington Post. Somehow this came across my attention. Just thought, hey, I'll just see what they're reporting. And it was actually a really interesting article that really looked at the science of a lot of different features of exercise as it pertains to cancer. And what the gist of it is, is that more and more studies are showing that not only does exercise lower the risk of developing cancer, it does seem to control cancer disease progression and potentially enhances your function and your outcome if you do develop cancer. So there's not only a benefit of, the, of exercise before you are diagnosed with cancer and potentially lower the risk, but before you start treatment, while you're undergoing treatment, and even after cancer treatment, exercise may actually be helpful for a number of different cancers. That's been shown in breast cancer patients. Regular physical activity improves their cognitive function uh, in people with breast cancer. Physical activity, very, very important in prevention and control of cancers, bladder cancer, breast, colon, endometrial, esophageal, renal, gastric cancers, study after study after study. But what's interesting is it looks like they're starting to be able to quantify how much exercise you need to make a difference if you do develop cancer. And it looks like it's the same thing that's recommended by the physical activity guidelines put out by the government. 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise every week dramatically improves survival if you have cancer. Moderate to vigorous exercise, what it does is it cha makes changes at a molecular level that affect the growth of those cancer cells and development of those cancer cells. It also lessens the side effects of, say, chemotherapy and other cancer treatments. Um, another thing that's been looked at is as uh, looking at exercise as it pertains to preventing cancer, and it's thought to boost things that affect your risks for cancer, boosting your immune function, boosting hormones and other molecules that are made during exercise that suppress cancer cell growth. Exercise increases blood flow, which is always good to help treatment if you do have a tumor. Exercise lowers inflammation in the body and lowers uh, fat, increases muscle that are thought to be good for tissue. Exercise increases myokines, which are released by the muscles when cancer cells are exposed to myokines, their propensity for growth and spread, metastasis, goes down greatly. Also, people with a higher fat mass tend to have poorer survival, survival with cancer, so exercise hopefully lowers your cancer uh, risk because, or your risk of death from cancer because it's lowering your fat mass. So, for so many reasons, again, immune system benefits, blood flow to the tumor, delivering chemotherapy to it, surviving uh, the side effects of the cancer treatments to uh, suppress the proliferation differentiation of cancer cells, exercise is very, very good. So one of the things that you're gonna hear among people, I think this is gonna come out more and more, when people are diagnosed with really any type of cancer, what's going to be discussed is, hey, one of the things we need to get you on, whether you're gonna have surgery, whether you're gonna have chemotherapy, whether you're gonna have radiation or something else, you know, in Germany, nutritional therapies that they're doing for cancer and in other parts of the world too, exercise I think is gonna become a key part of the treatment regimen. I, I, I think there's benefits to exercise throughout life and cancer doesn't change that. If anything, it increases the need for exercise. All right, another benefit of exercise is it seems to cut your risk of stroke. This is a pretty simple one, but this study is another big journal, Journal of the American Medical Association in their JAMA Network Open. What they looked at is any level of physical activity, whether it's things like walking your dog, playing catch with your kids, doing housework like mopping, vacuuming, things like that, all of that may be potentially good in preventing stroke. Remember, stroke is a preventable disease, but it's the second most common cause of death in the United States. It's the third most common cause of disability in the world. Physical activity is a huge, huge risk factor, or I should say physical inactivity, huge risk factor for stroke. But what we don't know is really how much you have to exercise, how intense you have to exercise. So what they did is uh, they took people uh, that did 150 minutes of moderate to vigorous aerobic exercise a week, and it's been shown that that reduces the risk of stroke, especially in older adults. There were 7,600 people or more in this study, 55, uh, 45 years 
of age and older. They wore these accelerometers on their hip that had motion detectors that very, very precisely recorded when they were physically active, how long they were physically active, how long they sat throughout the day, and how long they were inactive. They followed these people for seven and a half years, or almost seven and a half years. 268 of them had a stroke in those seven and a half years. And what they found was people who were sedentary for 13 hours a day or more had a 44% increased risk of having a stroke. But being physically active, even at a moderate level, didn't even have to be exercise. It could be, again, housework, playing with your kids, walking a dog, anything like that can lower your risk of stroke. Now, 13 hours a day, you're like, there is no way I sit 13 hours a day. But let's just say you work at a job where you're doing information work. You sit at your computer, type, send emails, have Zoom conference calls and things like that. That's seven, eight hours a day you're sitting. Then you go home, if you watch a lot of TV, you sit and have dinner with your kids, all of that adds up as sitting time. And it's a huge, huge, huge risk factor for stroke. So find some ways, and I've talked about ways to be active during the course of your work day. And just briefly, taking the stairs instead of taking the elevator. Uh, anytime you're on the phone, cell phone, put, put in your AirPods or earbuds, whatever, Take that call while you're standing up or walking around. Instead of sending an email to somebody in your office, walk across the office, go talk to that person. It's probably better for social reasons too. And the one that I love, but nobody seems to, to wanna do it, instead of having meetings, because I, I absolutely despise meetings, hate them, hate them, hate, hate them, uh, from probably from all my years in academic medicine uh, where everybody meets about everything all the time, but, have walking meetings instead. Instead of sitting at a conference table, everybody get up and walk and talk. Uh, you probably find a lot, have people do a lot fewer meetings, and if you do have to have a meeting, you'll probably get some exercise. All right, last thing, because I know I'm going long. I want to talk about this real quick. This is a big deal. The last study I want to talk about tonight is a study that came out a few weeks ago talking about how walking actually decreases knee pain in people with arthritis. Over 32 million people in the United States have osteoarthritis, the so-called wear and tear arthritis. I've talked before, I don't like that. I think that's a little oversimplistic or actually inaccurate. It's not really a wear and tear problem, it's more of an inflammation problem. But having said that, almost 33 million adults in the United States have osteoarthritis. This was a study out of Baylor in Houston. It was published in the journal Arthritis and Rheumatology. It's a great study. These people, they, uh, researchers studied over 1,000 people, 50 and older with knee osteoarthritis, followed them for four years. 37% of the people in the study who did not walk for exercise, and that wasn't walking to, at the grocery store or going to the subway station, but they didn't walk for exercise. 37% of those people developed new and frequent knee pain. Only 26% of the people who did walk for exercise develop new frequent knee pain. And again, after four years, those, those who started off without frequent knee pain, they had arthritis, but the knee pain wasn't too bad, but they walked for exercise at least 10 times, much less likely to have new regular bouts of knee stiffness or aches around their knee. They also, this is the key, they had less structural damage in the knee than did the people who didn't walk for exercise. It was particularly effective for people with osteoarthritis who had bow-legged, and that's a lot of people, that's a longer discussion about where certain compartments of the knee develop arthritis and you get collapse in a specific area. But walking is good, it's free, anybody can do it. And here's the thing, we have gone decades in orthopedic surgery telling people if you've got knee or hip arthritis, don't do impact exercise, running, long distance walking, fast walking, things like that, because it's gonna wear out your knees faster. This is showing that that doesn't seem to be the case. If anything, it's the opposite. It seems to protect your knees, it seems to be good for the cartilage, good for the bone, and be better for your knee pain. Also, here's one of my problems when you tell people, hey, you can't run anymore, you can't walk anymore. Very often, that's what they like to do. So then they get fat, they get overweight, they get out of uh, good health, out of shape. Then their medical risks for all kinds of things, cardiovascular disease, stroke, all sorts of things go way up. It also makes the complications after the joint replacement worse. You want people in good health. So any exercise, I would say, is a good thing, but this is one of those studies that shows that impact exercise is not something you should go away from if you have 
osteoarthritis. All right, that's all I've got for you. If you have comments, where's my comment button? Definitely uh, share those for a few seconds. I have a couple uh, points. If you know people that like discussions of orthopedics, injuries, surgeries, rehab, whether health, wellness, exercise, nutrition, uh, mental health, uh, longevity, aging, all this kind of stuff that I love talking about. Peptides, exosomes, some of the uh, newer non-surgical treatments that are out there. I love talking about that as well. Tell them about this show. You can find me pretty much across social media, including where you are now, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, at Dr. David Geyer on all those, D-R-D-A-V-I-D-G-E-I-E-R. My website is drdavidgeyer.com, D-R-D-A-V-I-D-G-E-I-E-R. Definitely check that out as well. Make sure you check out the Better Than Ever live podcast. If you cannot be here on Thursday afternoons, 5 p.m., listen to it the next day on your way to work or at the gym. Definitely can't comment, but you can still catch up on all of these studies. Also, check out the Better Than Ever daily podcast, Monday through Friday, tips less than a minute long that are similar to this, that help you know and and take steps to benefit your exercise and nutrition and longevity and aging and feeling great and all that kind of good stuff. It's really great, and you can listen to 10, 15, 20 of them on your way to work. So check out Better Than Ever Daily, both Better Than Ever Live, Better Than Ever Daily, wherever you get your podcasts. And last, if you'd like to see me as a patient specifically, I see patients in Charleston, South Carolina, and Charlotte, North Carolina, but if you're coming from outside of those two states, we have you come to Charleston, which is amazing. It's a great city, you'll love it. Uh, And I get a lot of people that travel in uh, to see me, but go to my website, the link is in the description below, and there's a contact form on my website. Just send me a message, click the, schedule an appointment, describe your your problem just real briefly. My assistant and I can help set that up. Thank you so much for being here. I know it kind of went long today, but a lot. The walking for arthritis topic I wanted to talk about, and I wanted to talk about the terzepatide and semaglutide. Uh, so, and tomorrow, if you want to talk about that, I'm here tomorrow for Ask Dr. Guy Live, 12 p.m. Eastern time. If you have an orthopedic question, that's my one time a week where I do answer those and one place I answer those. That's only on YouTube. Uh, but if you want to ask about semaglutide or terzepatide or anything we talked about today, if you want to ask that tomorrow, feel free to do that. Thank you so much. If I don't see you tomorrow for Ask Dr. Geyer Live, I hope you have a fantastic weekend. Those of you in the United States have a wonderful and safe holiday weekend, and I will see you very soon. Take care.